Our next speaker, Fred Harper. As a senior developer advocate at DigitalOcean, Fred helped startups find success in the cloud and get the most out of the Hatch program. He shared his passion for technology on the stage at over 150 events all over the world. And a fun fact, contrary to what you might see, Fred is not actually bald, he just shaves his head. <laughs> Everybody please welcome Fred Harper. I was like, where the fuck do you get that fact? And I just remember I wrote this. <laughs> I was like, he's right. We don't know each other, and he's right about me. So how is life? Pretty good? That, that bad? I'm pretty, no, it's a good conference. You should be like happy and excited or just overwhelmed, like you learned too much, and now you're tired. Thank you. <laughs> I can go back home if you want. <laughs> it's a joke, it's a joke. My name is Fred, uh, Frederick Harper. I'm from Montreal. I didn't come to Toronto since the last two, three years. I was not missing it. No, it's a joke. I love Toronto. Uh, it just did not happen. But I love FIDC. I love Well Unleashed. I spoke here a couple of times. Uh, I guess they didn't have anybody else to fill the schedule. So they asked me to do a talk. Uh, I'm a senior developer, evangelist, or advocate, or whatever you call this at DigitalOcean. My job is to give love to developer and help you being successful, hopefully, in our platform. But I'm not here today to talk about DigitalOcean. Feel free to tweet uh, during the presentation, or feel free to like, look like you tweet if you're not listening, so at least I won't feel bad. But if you tweet, use at FHarper. This is my endo. Also, I'm recording that talk that's going to be online, so no need to take notes. I will put the resources on my website, YouTube, whatever, whatever. So how many people are developers in the room? The other people, what are you doing here? <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. Uh, you're going to be OK with that talk, I guess. Any business people, like no code at all, like just like you consider yourself as a business person? That's a good thing. <laughs> so I've been doing this for years. Uh, software development, I'm way older than I look like. Should have been my fun fact. People who cannot code. Coding is fucking hard. It's what they say. It's what they say. It's not me. It's what they say. People who don't try at all, like never try to code, they're like, shit, no. That thing is fucking hard. Uh, sorry for the people, like, I swear, but it's probably done after that slide ish. Teachers, people who teach how to code, like either in, uh, you know, like CodeCam or at university, coding is fucking hard. Novice developer, you're starting, you're a junior developer, you're going out of school. There's some novice developer that thought that they know everything. That changed after two weeks in the real world. <laughs> yeah, coding is hard. Pro developers, like pro developers, coding is fucking hard. Famous developer, you know those people who have like 10,000 followers on Twitter or more than that, like uh, they're doing like coding on Twitch or whatever that the famous developers are doing. Coding is fucking hard. <laughs> Business people. <laughs> coding is easy. I've heard this so often. <laughs> no, seriously, this is why I ask, is there any business people here? Because I'm going to like kick you out of my room. Like, <laughs> seriously? Like, I've, I've been doing this. Like, I'm a software developer for 16 years or 17, or I don't know. For the last couple of years, I'm talking more about code than I'm coding. I still consider myself as a developer. And except when I started and I thought, like, I'm young, I know everything, and, like, I'm a super, like, I have super power. I still believe I have super power. I just know that I don't know how to use them most of the time. Uh, like, coding is hard, and, and this is one of the reality. It's not easy. So today, my goal is to try to make it a little bit easier for people like me, uh, lazy developers. When I started, <laughs> I look at people and they were maybe not even born, I don't know. Uh, when I started, we used to have devices that were not powerful at all. Like the hardware was not good. Actually, it was good for that time. But compared to today's time, like the hardware we have, the devices we have, it's not even comparable. And the thing is that like, I read something not too long ago, like that the computer that brought us to the moon, like the iPhone, is more powerful than that computer. Like, a computer that brought us to the moon. Like, that is crazy. But today, the thing I have in my pocket, my phone, sorry, is more powerful than any other hardware. 
Uh, we did not even have the smartphone before. Uh, we didn't have that many platforms either. When I started, it was like, let's code for a desktop that is 800 by 600 pixels of resolution. That was the only thing I had to care about. And the thing is that like now we have more devices. <laughs> I look somewhere like, oh shit, that hold? Yes. Uh, now we have to take, about, take care about a lot of devices. And for some of you in the room that knows that thing, that was making the noise of hell, but that was the box that we're using to connect to the internet. I was using that. That was so terrible. That was fast at that time, but compared to today, that was so slow. And the technology was like, if I was using this, we had a phone line, you know, not, not like a smartphone. There's a thing that you plug in a wall and you use this to call people or make like a fire sign. Uh, but like those things, when I was using this to connect to the internet, my parents were not able to make a call or receive a call. Anyhow, my point is, I think it was a little bit easier when I started coding than it is today. And I had way much less tool than we have today. I had, but I had less technology to take care about. And the thing is that we lost track of how to code for devices that are not that powerful, to internet connection that are not that fast, to like having a great experience on many devices. So again, my goal today, it is about not talking to you about the new shiny framework that does not going to exist in six months. It's really about with the tool you have today, how can you create a better experience for your users. So this is the talk today. This is what I'm going to talk about. Let's start, let's start with the ar architecture. There is some word in English, I don't know, like architecture. Is it good? Architecture? Sounds great. French is my first language. Is it, you, you didn't know. Mm. Actually, the good French, not like Dave in the back who is coming from Paris, like their French, their French are a little bit weird, like the Quebec one, the best one. So. Damn, I'm recording this. Uh, <laughs> so you start with your architecture. That starts from the bottom. Not all the time you can do that, but when you start to work on a new project, there is that book. It is quite whole. Uh, Josh Clark wrote this after the first iPhone. Actually, not the first one. The first one you were able to create application. Tap Wordy. It's about iPhone development. But the thing is that he brought us like three motivations for what a user are using or what your customers are doing with your application. And I think it's still relevant today, and we need to keep this in mind when we are architecting our application. First, in this case, it was like I'm micro-tasking because it was on the phone. But I will say I'm tasking, I'm creating, I'm doing something with your application. And now people look at me like Fred, you're a genius, like just Clark was too. Like people do tasks on computer, like you're so brilliant. No. But actually, yes, but like, the case for those tasks is that we need to keep this in mind when we're building your application. I'm local, which is not true anymore just for smartphone. I'm traveling a lot. I have my laptop. I need to find a restaurant. I'm going to do this on my laptop. Obviously, now I'm talking about Google Maps, but I can use any other tools so people can be local, which is the second kind of like motivation people will have to use your application. The third one, I'm bored which may not apply for application if it's for a line of business. But why I'm saying those things is that most of the time I think we lose focus on why we build those applications. And yes, at the end of the day, don't get me wrong, I want to have customers going to pay for my services because I want to have a paycheck and get a living. But I'm building application, I'm building experience for my users, and I need to keep those things in mind. Think about the cloud. And I kind of like catch the end of the panel before we're talking about serverless. It's a different way to architecture your application. You need to think about that. Even if you're not going serverless, there's less and less people doing on-premise, uh, like having your server on site or managing your server yourself. What you want to do today is that you don't want to do everything by yourself. Like, is there any services out there that can help me? But you need to think about, like, will I do many microservices? Will I go with, uh, I don't know, REST API? How am I going to do to manage my database? Like, do I want to manage everything myself? Do I want to use a database as a service somewhere so I don't have to be a database manager, like, just caring about the data that will go in and out? So all those things need to, you need to think about those right at the beginning when you can. You don't have to play with all the toys. And this is a thing I struggled for years. Maybe I'm a little bit more wiser right now when it comes to that. 
but my main focus was web development for years. And web development is, is it's a shit show. <laughs> like, don't get me wrong, I love it. But there is a new framework every day. There is a new, new, new something all the time. And it's part of my job now for a couple of years to learn those things because I need to know what's new, what's next, uh, what people are going to use, what's going to be helpful for me to help developers. It's part of my job, and I cannot follow everything that is happening. And that goes out also with like software development. When you're thinking about your application, I know, you're excited. You want to play with the latest Shine, Shine tool. Maybe it's not what you need for your application. I remember one of the last hackathon I did, uh, I was like, I can help you with everything. And, and don't get me wrong, I don't know everything. But you came to me with a Ruby issue. I don't really know Ruby that much. I would probably find a way to help you uh, or, or find a solution. And the kids, I, and I said the kids, not in a pretentious way. I can be pretentious, but not for that situation. It was like, really, they were kids. And it was like, damn, I really started and you were not born. But uh, it took me more time to set up my laptop to help them with all the framework and all the tools that we're using. And when, when we think about Docker and all those tools that should make our life easier, it took me more time to set up everything than find, like trying to help them to find the issue. And the thing is that after a couple hours, they got a really nice development environment, but they had nothing for the hackathon done yet, which is like, it's fine. You're learning these things. It's fine you want to play with those things. And Nakaton is probably the nice place to do this. Out of work, in a business, when you create a startup, maybe not. So I know you want to play with the latest and the, the shiny tool. Maybe it's not always the time to do it. And I never considered myself as a like super amazing developer. I think I'm an average developer. I'm good at what I do. There's people that are way better than me. And there's people that are less, <laughs> less uh, as good as me. But uh, I think I'm not that bad. And I love to code. This is what I love to do. But one of the principles I try to keep in mind is that I don't want to reinvent the wheel. The wheel. Actually, there's things out there. There's framework. There's also like that kind of like philosophy. We see this a little more in Node, which, which is like, uh, how do you call this? Like, micro library or something like that where like you have a library that does one thing but like do it very very well and that's fine maybe you end up with like i used to work at npm just before i am right now and like all my friends sent me that like like that gif image where like you say npm install and like there's a deluge of like things happening for i see the node developer in the room that are laughing sometimes you do npm install npm he and like shit like there is a ton shit of like uh, oh, <laughs> what happened? People say that I have two face. So I put the mic. In the That's not true. Someone want to sing a song? Good <laughs> time. Is it good now? Actually, I don't even need a mic, but uh, was to please Matthew Potter. <laughs> Someone know Potter. OK, so you don't need to reinvent the well. There's library out there. And I know hardcore developer wants to build everything from scratch. No, <laughs> please don't. This is not how you're going to be successful. It's good if you want to learn. It's good if it's, you do this as a passion in your free time. Uh, but like, if you're building a serious business, just use what's out there. You cannot be good at everything. Actually, nobody is good at everything. There's people that are way better for specific things. There are framework that are, that are way better for you. So don't reinvent the wheel. When it comes to design, not an expert. Uh, when I was coding full time, it was a well-known thing that I was coding stuff, and we needed someone to go after me to make it nice. But it was working, like just to make it beautiful. But what I always kept in mind, there is that thing that we were talking about since years now, uh, outside of responsive web design, at some point, someone coined the, the term of like mobile first or content first, which are not similar, but, but kind of. And I think we should still apply this. People tend to forget that because it was like, no, we talked about this a long time ago. It should be like uh, part of like everyone's process, which is not. And what does that mean is that we have a lot of space when it comes to the screen, laptop, desktop, like, there's a lot of space on our screen, and we tend to put everything and anything, all the feature on the screen, 
But when it comes on a smaller device, we don't give a great experience to users. And things like these happen. Oh, I want to create a flight simulator. That is nice. Everything is there. And maybe it's good if I want to be an expert. But I, as a user, maybe what I want is that. I want to take off, and I want to land. And we tend to forget those things. So by starting with a smaller screen, what I do is that I prioritize what's important for my users. What features make sense? What are the features that my user may use in different situations with different devices? And after that, go crazy with the space you're going to have on the desktop, or go crazy with the space you're going to have like on a larger tablet. But if you take mobile first, that's going to give you an advantage when it comes to the experience for your users. There's also something called the Fitz Law. Simple thing, mathematics. So we're going to spend the next 30 minutes to learn about it. <laughs> That's not true. Oh. Do you need a mic? This is good. Do I really need a mic or recording? Yeah, OK, I'll put the mic. <laughs> because you were so, uh, yeah, Fred, we heard you. No mic. That should be good. I don't know why it's always. Yeah, my glasses. The lack of hair. I shave it. <laughs> so the translation for Fitz Law. That's not funny. <laughs> yeah, you can laugh with your long hair. Yeah. You're jealous. So Fitz Law can be translated by the bigger and closer a target is, the easier it is to hit. How often, and, and, and now I see people looking at me like, Fred, like your talk is like basic stuff. I'm like, yes. Do you do it? Nope. So <laughs> like the number of time I cancel uh, a submission of a form and had to re-enter everything because the cancel was next to the submit. And on my phone, maybe I have big tongue, uh, tongue, <laughs> big tongue. <sighs> That's a long week. <laughs> big tongue. Uh, maybe it's my fault. But if you start again, I'm coming back to mobile first. If you start by giving a great experience on mobile, who cares once you're going to be on the desktop that there is a lot of spaces between the buttons? That actually, that's just going to give a better experience. I love clean and more minimal and more impactful type of UI. Maybe it's just me, but I think outside of like just the design or the aesthetic, it's also uh, giving a great experience to the users. But optimizing is probably the biggest thing that we forget in the past. Uh, how many of you know Google Lighthouse? That's good. You're ru ruining the next 10 minutes of my talk. <laughs> no, that's a joke. I joke a lot. It's my way of doing talk. I don't know. Uh, I use a couple of tools. Uh, Lighthouse is one. Uh, and when I say optimize is what we call also obfuscation, which is basically taking your code. And we used to do that years ago to really try to protect our code so nobody steal the business uh, logic that we have behind it. But today, I think it's mostly used to try to shrink your code. And when I say optimize or uh, obfuscating, usually uh, you're going to write your code, hopefully, with variable or function name that you can understand and you know what they're doing. And when you obfuscate, it's just taking that variable that is like creating, I don't know, like to do list plus plus. That's going to change that variable name to A, B, or C. So the code won't be something that you can understand. But on a smaller code, the footprint won't be that big. But the more bigger the code base is, the more those optimization will reduce the file size. And that will help you with the speed for your application in terms of like uh, the internet bandwidth. So CSS Nano is one tool I use. I use everything that is. Uh, I love everything that is on the common line because that gave me the opportunity to, I'm a common line type of person more than a UI type of person when I do my things in my computer. But on top of that is that all those tools, I can use them on my uh, CI or, or CD pipeline because I can install them on any computer and with a common uh, in my bash, I can make it happen. So I'll use this for CSS. Oh, I can show you just the example of like how it is in terms of like that was my code before here, and this is my code after, which in the case of CSS is still readable. And most of the browser right now, when you look at the source, they're going to uh, like indent and beautify the source for you. So it's less about uh, hiding your stuff, more about optimizing. And in that case, it's really a small example. But in case of a bigger file, 
you're going to shrink your file a lot. And as an example, I have uh, most everybody that does JavaScript use uh, jQuery at some point. And you know you can download two versions of jQuery when you install it or if you're using the CDN. But if I go there, um, I have my first jQuery file that is not obfuscated, which is like nearly 300 kilo, uh, kilobytes. And the obfuscated one is like 88 kilobytes, which is not that much right now. But think about 100 users, 1,000 users, 1 million users. With the cost of the cloud today, this is where most of the time you get your having great invoice. Uh, it's with the data. So those things are really important. For JavaScript, I really love to use uh, the Minify tool from Babel. Uh, it's on GitHub. It's working well also. Uh, again, it's about minifying. But when it comes to optimizing, what I love to do, and this is my blog, so the Google Lighthouse. I can go and Google uh, the dev tool from Chrome. Uh, obviously, you need to have Chrome installed, but this is the only thing. Now it's part of Chrome. A couple of months ago, it was still a website, an external website. They included maybe a year ago even so. And there's that tab called Audit. And now what I can do, I can say, like, check for performances, uh, progressive web app. If I use it, I don't have it on my slide. Uh, best practices, accessibility, SEO. And I can start to run an audit. And that audit, uh, thank you, Chrome. I had already run the audit because it takes a couple of minutes. But uh, what's going what's to happen is that Chrome will evaluate my website in terms of like performance, accessibility, SEO, and it will give me a score. And obviously, the person who is like, my pride is like, yeah, I really want to see the score. Uh, and like, I'm really sad when the score is not that good. Oh, 99 on performance, yes. Uh, so there's like that, that ego in me is like, oh, that's good. But who really care about the score? What's important, actually, I do. <laughs> like outside of that, uh, what's nice is that on the thing that you may not be that good, you can check the details. And it's a little bit small. But you can check the detail. I can click on it. And what I love is less about the tool itself, more about, hey, that part was not that good. Uh, if you want to learn more about how to make it happen, how to change it, how to optimize it, Google will give you tips about specific issues you're having on your website. So it's free. It's part of Google Chrome. Uh, it's in the dev tool. It's one of the tools I really love. And no matter which you love Google or no, you use Google or no, install maybe Chrome just for that reason, makes sense. And please don't do the test on my website because uh, that talk is a situation of like do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> my blog is like, I need to update my blog for a couple of things. Uh, but this is one of the main tools I'm using. I'm just facing the photographer back like this. So yeah, this is, so the second thing is, <laughs> joking, man, <laughs> HTTP request. Uh, there's like now I'm going to show you a couple of like bunch of like quick tips and tricks. Uh, one of the main thing that uh, that tool from Google, take a picture. <laughs> that tool from Google uh, will do. It's about you missed your shot, man. Uh, HTTP request avoid as much as possible redirection because the thing is that, and it's something we forget also. Every time there's a new file or something like or connection to the server. It's exactly a connection to the server. You're doing HTTP request. Those things make time. No matter the size of your file, just making the connection. So the more of those connections you have, so if I access your website and the link is not going to more you're doing your direction, I'm moving to another place. I did two calls to access the same page. So I vo avoid those as much as possible. Hang code, JZIP, your data. It's kind of like a transparent process. You can easily configure this in HTXS, uh, Nginx, uh, web config for people using the other thing, IIS. Uh, it's transparent. What's going to happen is that you're going to use the power of uh, the server and the power of the client. So you're going to compress, compress stuff, and you're going to push this to the server. Uh, image sprites, when it makes sense. Uh, the idea is to put many images in one. So again, uh, you're going to have to play probably with CSS or JavaScript, whatever you want to do, to uh, display different part of the images when it makes sense. But it means that you will have only one HTTP request. I, it's a tricky trick. 
Can I say that? It's a tweak trick. Because uh, I, I think it's, it's good to do, but most of the time it doesn't make sense to do with because you're stuck with one images and doing many things out of it. CDN, Cloudflare, it's probably one of the most popular. Uh, content delivery network, use this uh, because depending where your customers are, uh, it's a way for you to give access. Most of the time it's going to be for static resources, images, or even JavaScript or CSS file, things that are static that you're proposing to your users. It's fine there on one server, but like if I'm in San Francisco, in Toronto, and uh, my code is in Europe somewhere, the difference won't be that big. We're, we have internet, it's fast to big. Still, that makes a difference where I access a local server. And that made such a big difference. There is a lot of research, and I'm not doing a good job at putting links about research there, but like there's like newspaper, like big company that did research. And for like one milli, like not one second wait more than like other content, they lose like 30 or 40% of readers where people move to another place or don't read the article for one second because it's that time. I don't know for you, <laughs> it's good for everything. Like when I sign up for something and you know, they always send you an email to confirm your email. I'm like refreshing my inbox, like after five seconds of like, they didn't work, there's an issue. And that can happen like 10 seconds after, like not a good service, what the hell? Like 10 seconds to send me an email to confirm my, my email. Like it's, it's, you know, we're at that kind of like period where we need to optimize our things that it is so fast because this is what users want. Cache the content, which is one other thing I'm not really doing well on my site, but uh, the browser, use the browser, the browser will cache contents for you, but you can tell the browser how to do it. And without even that configuration, uh, Chrome as an example is pretty aggressive in terms of like caching stuff, uh, but you can configure this HTTP, HTTP cache headers. Uh, you also have the, X, uh, the, aim with I, the same thing with IIS, uh, expires, expires response header. With JavaScript, a bunch of quick trips, uh, tips. Avoid creating new object as much as possible. And now I look like a freak who's like trying to optimize every byte of like every bits of like everything you're doing. Maybe, but in terms of like when you have a lot of logic, you have a lot of JavaScript code, it may make a difference. It, it will probably make a difference. You probably won't see that difference on a standard computer, but when you come with other devices, it will make sense. And one of the things we forget, uh, maybe it's just me, but one of the things I forgot before, I did not know, I did not realize being like that, that white Canadian man with full privilege with a fast internet connection. Uh, when I started to travel, and I was like, oh, we're complaining a lot about internet in Canada because actually it's quite expensive compared to elsewhere, but it's fast. And I was at that Acton, and, 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 and now I'm not bragging about my traveling, it's a real example. Uh, I was in India and was doing that Acton, and I was like, damn, there's an issue with the Wi-Fi. So I went to talk to the organizer and I was like, I think there's a problem with the Wi-Fi. And you know, like they're, they're super nice and they want to, and they were freaking out like, oh no, we got Fred here, like the internet is not working. And they came back they're like, oh, sorry, sir, the, the internet is like super fast. And I was like, fuck. <laughs> that remember me, the internet I had many, many years ago. And again, it's not about being pretentious, but like I was lucky, I had a really fast internet connection. And now I realized that all those folks that were there was working at Mozilla at the time, was writing, writing blog posts with like nice images and it was like loading fast air. And when, when they were telling me like, hey Fred, I read your blog post that was super nice, they probably wait five minutes to get that blog post because of my like crazy image. So you, we need to think about more than just herself. We're lucky, there's other places they're not lucky. It's not even about that. Just go to a hotel and use the Wi-Fi. You're gonna live the full experience of like throttling and not really having a good experience. So, uh, sorry, not the Ilton, the other one. <laughs> I have my membership too, so. Uh, <laughs> if you load JavaScript file, do it at the end of the, uh, at the end of like your web page. Uh, things that is, like we teach those years ago, those are the things I learned when I started to do a little more JavaScript. And we tend to forget those because it's fast. But you're blocking the rendering, and again, you're losing performance point, and it's not as fast, and it's not as a good experience. So what you can do, try to get something visual and have the functionality to your website right after. Usually it's not even a second. So it doesn't change much for you, for the experience. 
actually, it will change a lot for the experience because you're going to get a visual first. Async, 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 async. That was everything I had to say about async. <laughs> JSON is faster than XML. I thought it was the standard. And you know, when I, I say all those things, it's not like, oh, I know things and I teach you. No, those are the things that I relearned by coding recently. It's not like, oh, I'm so much better. No, no. Those are the things I realized, like, I was doing in this in the past, and you don't believe me that JSON is faster than XML? No? Sorry? XML. Yeah, there's still people using XML. Yeah. I don't hear you. OK. That's cool. You can use XML. Just don't talk to me. Uh, no, but like, like it's, it's, it's just little things like this. XML was a great thing. But uh, can I, I really want to talk with those guys. Anyhow, uh, JSON is way faster. Uh, so just a thing to keep in mind. Uh, if you have to remember one thing, no, it does not even work. Don't fix it if it's not broken. No, I'm dead serious. <laughs> like, don't fix it if it's not broken. You don't always need a framework or a library. There's that thing called get element by ID. Like, you don't need jQuery to get a dot, like an element from your DOM. You may need jQuery for a lot of things. But you, you, know, you know what I'm trying to say, I guess, or maybe it's just in my head. But like, you don't need a library to do everything or everything because that just, you're just adding some footprint to your application. Obviously, there's a lot of other nice things you can do with jQuery. It was just an example. But again, I'm coming back to my kids at uh, Akaton. Whoa, like we're using a ton of tools that I was like, I don't even know what what are those, and I'm pretty sure I know a couple of, like, I don't know all the technology, but at least I heard the name, and we're using so many things that, like, sometimes too much is too much. Third tip, please don't fix it if it's not broken. No, seriously, please don't. Put as much logic as you can on the server side. We were doing this a couple of years ago more about protecting your IP, like protecting your business uh, rule. Now I think it's more about speeding up the process. Like when you do a lot of like, you have to go through a lot of data, use the power of the server. I did this for you. Uh, use the power of the server. Uh, so sometimes, and most of the time, it's gonna be way faster to do the logic on the server and transfer the result after to the customer. And even more when it comes to like using GPU offer in the cloud, and, and when you do a lot of analysis, uh, try to put as much as you can on the server. Same things when it comes to a uh, mobile application, you don't need to do everything on a mobile, even if it's more powerful than it used to, it's not as powerful as a server. I'm serious. Don't fix it if it's not broken. And why I'm saying that, like I, I have two examples in mind. Uh, anyone working for uh, if this then that? Oh, I was worried for a second. Uh, I love that service. I use them for years. But recently, they did a redesign of the UI. And like a big shit show happened on Twitter. Like people were like, what's going to happen? And like the design is nice. And I've been using the tool for years. Please don't quote me on this on Twitter. I've been using the, uh, the tool for years. And I was not about to do the basic stuff that I was doing the day before. I was looking how to add an RSS feed that will go to my pocket account, which was one of the main thing I use of this and that for. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm using that tool for years. I was working perfectly well. They did a new rede redesign, and I'm pretty sure I, I kind of like understand the business reason. But they screw most users with that. And they got a lot of complaint, and they did a great job managing those. I'm still using the service, but that was the type of redesign I would like. <laughs> Maybe you should have to like think about not redoing everything. And that goes for everything in life. Last time I was at that, you know, those kind of like bad shower you get like at home or in the hotel. And you usually like you start the bat, you pour the water, and you, you pull something, and after that, hey, magic, like this is a shower now. <laughs> and I was at that place. It took me five minutes to start the shower. I was like, I know I'm asleep, I didn't get my coffee. But the thing is that how do you call this? You know, usually you pull that thing. I had to pull down the, don't even know the word in French, the kind of like, you know, 
Okay, but do a draw me at something. You know, there's that thing, that port of water. How do you call this? Faucet. Faucet, yeah. I had to pull down the top of the faucet down. Anyhow, I'm like, there's three ways you can start a shower in life. Like, you pull that thing, you turn that thing, or whatever, or you, you put on it. And it was like, seriously, a shower. A shower. So anyhow, no, no relation to tech. I just wanted to talk that, tell that story because I love it. Uh, so yeah, don't fix it if it's not broken. One of the most underrated thing is images. We don't care about images anymore. We're just like, they're nice. We're putting them out there. Use native image resolution, please. Like, don't change the dimension with CSS. Do it if you do some responsive things, whatever. Even that, you can like provide different images to the people depending on the uh, resolution you have or depending on the, um, like the, the, the space on the screen you have. Uh, use GIMP, Photoshop, cut the image if you don't need all the images. But that will save a lot of bandwidth. Use the right image format. Funny enough, I did not know that thing until like two years ago. Like there is a proper format depending on what you do. And I really thought I was stupid, but I realized I'm, I was not the only stupid person. Uh, like if you take a picture, JPEG. If it's an image, something you draw on a computer, PNG. And that will change everything for whatever reason that I don't understand. I didn't really look on the internet. I just know it's a thing. Uh, the compression will be totally different. And the size of your images will be totally different too. So think about those. And there is tools out there that are going to help you to do that. Uh, use image preview for videos. It's, uh, I think most platforms do it by default right now, but you probably need to do it. And the most important, compress your image. And you don't need to be like a Photoshop wizard to do that. Uh, there's a lot of common line too that helps you to do that. Personally, again, told you I'm lazy. Uh, there is image min, a CLI, use it in a common line. Working well, uh, compression wise, I don't know if it's the uh, algorithm that I'm using, like the plugin, they call this the plugin that I'm using with it. It's doing a great job, but it's not doing a great job as that service that I'm using called uh, Short Pixel. I don't make any money from them. I just use them for years. It's really nice. They have a free offer where you can compress X amount of images for free per month, which is good enough for most people because usually you compress images at the beginning of your project and once you change the UI, unless you're a news platform or a blog, now you're going to have more images. But even that, uh, you pay for it. It's not that expensive. But I post, uh, I put a picture of a cat. Oh, of course. I put a picture of a cat because I love cats. It's six megabytes. And the picture is really nice. It's a nice cat. It's not my cat, so it's not that nice, but uh, it's good enough. And there's different, like, compression. Um, that's not loading. There's different, comp different compression level that I can use. And that image, I don't know if you see it, probably not. Level lossy, you're gonna lose a little bit of quality. Maybe not that much for most people, but I noticed it that was getting on my nerve. Uh, lossless is like the best compression you, you can have without losing everything, which like usually the compression level is not that good. Like you don't have a great gain when it comes to images. The, the glossy one is probably the most interesting in terms of like at least that service. They took my file, it was actually close to seven megabytes to not even one megabyte. It's five megabytes, and, and I know it's not that much, again, in the sense of like one images, but in the grand schema of thing, it's a lot. So if that works, I wanted to show you the difference, but you, I guess it's gonna be a case of like, you're gonna have to believe me, or I'm gonna re-upload the image, but I have some contents I want to show you. So believe me, if it's not the case, you're gonna have my email, send me some insanity because I was wrong. Test. Seriously, we don't test anymore. Like, yes, we're like, oh yeah, I, I do some unit testing and integration tests, but nobody tests the application anymore. Like, as a human, as a person, test it. And I remember when I was leading a team, my people just aided me because they were submitting, that was SVN at that time, or CSV, whatever. Git was not a thing, that was way simpler. Anyhow. Uh, and like they were submitting something where like that's working. I was like testing plenty of things. I was like, nope, that's not working. They were upset because like Fred, the user will never do that. It was like, <laughs> that's wishful thinking. So there's a lot of tools to help you to do that. Test yourself. Be the dumbest person you can know. 
<laughs> Why are you looking at me? <laughs> Be not that dumb, like try to have a proper level. Uh, and test, test, test. And what I love to do, um, one tool I use to test is called WebInt. And actually, it's not even about testing. Sorry, I skipped the level. I do, uh, I use JMocha, actually Mocha Q Unit. Um, but the extra mile, because I have only five minutes left. This guy's looking at me like, no, you have four. <laughs> so the extra mile. Think about security. It's always an afterthought. Right from the beginning, it should be from your application life cycle. It should be right from the beginning. Talk, think about security. Even more today than ever, it's time for us as developers to be responsible on that side. And how can you do that? You don't need to be an expert. Go on OWASP. They're having a cheat sheet. It's pretty, pretty nice. They're the organization when it comes to security, the nonprofit organization. They also uh, publish once a year, two year, the kind of like the trending, like security issues. And obviously, you don't become an expert by reading those, but you know enough that when you're going to code, when you're going to architect your application, you're going to think about those things. Think about accessibility. Welcome everyone on your platform. And accessibility can mean Visual impairing can mean I'm, I'm like colorblind, not like black and white type of colorblind, but I mix some like color that are close enough. That means that on some platform, the experience for me is not good. So try a website without a mouse. Nighttime, out of 10, you want to die uh, because the experience is terrible. So there's little things you can do. Read on accessibility, add labels to your image, like think about like using without uh, a mouse. Use screen readers. There's free open source screen reader that people that are blind or visual impaired use to access a website. Try it, please try it. Seriously, not on my website, but like try it. You're gonna have like such a bad experience. And this is what those people are living day to day. Obviously, I talk a little bit too much, but let me show you one of the latest two I have that I use a lot which is called WebInt. It's free. It's by the OpenJS Foundation. And it's a kind of like, it's a little bit like uh, Google Lighthouse, but with a different approach, I think. You know, the first result they're going to give me for my website is accessibility. And I have compatibility int, security int. Don't look at the result. Uh, performance. But what I love, again, it's less the tool itself more than the result. Because now I have like, OK, Link must have the discernible text. Yeah, that was just a social media icon. Oh, yeah, true. What happened with someone who was using a screen reader? So I can, how to fix it? And this is the important part for me is that I have a way to understand those things, fix those, and those are the basic things we should fix on our website. So do it. It's a free tool. You can do this in the command line. You can use it in the browser. So in the end, the philosophy of everything that I throw to you today, which was like a bunch of quick fix tips and things that are like Fred, like it's basic, I understood, I already do that. Things that were lying to yourself and were like, no, I know that, but in your head you're like, oh shit, I didn't do that for a long time. <laughs> the idea, the philosophy before my mic felt, insulate us, us being the user, the customer, from the complexity. Make things simple, easier. Make us accomplish your goal faster and securely. And make me awesome. Like, like, make your user awesome in the moment. This is what you need. And from line of business application to like social game, whatever, whatever you're building, the idea is to make the user awesome. And there is different ways to make that. So slides will be online, recording, if you still want to hear that talk again, for whatever reasons, that's going to be there. Or if you want to share with your coworkers, it's going to be there too. And on that note, I think I'm kind of like running out of time, but I'm going to be there for the break for question. If you're too shy to come talk to me, or you're jealous of my hair, or you think about something after, send me an email, fred at do.co, or frp at digitalocean.com. Uh, ping me on Twitter. This is one of my platform that I use the most. I don't understand Snapchat, so don't try. But uh, outside of that, yeah, send me questions about anything and everything, that talk, cloud. If I don't know the answer, I will find a person that knows the answer. So on that note, thanks for your time. And I hope you had a great time. <laughs>